Well, thank you so much. It's good to be back at Pepperdine. First of all, can you all hear me? Can you hear me all right? Okay, good. So let's see if you agree or disagree with most people your age. About uh, two years ago, the World Economic Forum sponsored a poll of over 1,000 18 to 24-year-olds in 94 countries around the world and asked those people whether they agreed or disagreed with the following question. So I'd like to get your thoughts on this too. So make a note to yourself if you agree or disagree. First, corruption is holding my country back. Jeremy, China? Yeah, oh, I, you don't have to say it out loud, Jeremy. No one's listening. <laughs> Angela, South Africa? Oh, okay. So we got our own minds. America, Professor Menendez? Yes? Okay. Mexico. Mexico? No problem. <laughs> No problem, Mexico, right? Middle East, Karen? No problem? No, no, no problem. Okay. Uh, corruption is causing lost opportunities for my generation. Agree, disagree, think of that. Third, corruption is a necessary part of the functioning in society. Agree or disagree, think of that. Okay, now here are the answers from the poll around the world. 72% of the respondents, 18 to 24 year olds, thought that corruption was holding their country back. There are people in Finland and Singapore who said, what? What are you talking about? <laughs> corruption is causing lost opportunities for my generation, also 72%. You didn't pick up my notes that I had on the desk here, did you? I think you yeah, might have. Yeah, yeah, I think you did. I'm so sorry. That's okay. Notes That's okay. Yeah. Thank you. They are worth money. <clears throat> about three or four cents. And then this one. Corruption is a necessary part of the functioning of society. Only 10% believe that cynical sentiment that you may have heard from your grandmother or grandfather once upon a time. Oh, you know, Wendell, there's corruption everywhere. It's part of the way the world works. Well, these young people don't buy it. They also asked them this question. To what extent do you think the international community should pay more attention to the effects of corruption and to its prevention and control? Uh, and 83% said, a great deal more. In 2011, Wynne and Gallup uh, did a poll around the world where they asked people to rate problems according to the things that were the most important problems facing their countries. And even though there was unemployment, terrorism, and so forth, number one around the world was corruption. In elections fought around the world, uh, most recently Sri Lanka, where the new president had surprised everybody by running on an anti-corruption ca campaign and won. His first actions were to set up an anti-corruption committee and even before the congressional elections coming up in 100 days, he wanted to have a plan of action that he could go to Congress with right away. If you go to some countries that have had a lot of upheavals, you'll find democracies suffering upheavals, uh, nominal democracies such as Egypt or Libya or Ukraine or Thailand, or many others suffering upheavals, the excuse that's often given is because these governments are corrupt. Anybody here from Thailand? Thailand last year had a military coup. Before it did, they were in the curious position of having the sitting president say, okay, let's stop the protests, let's have a new election. And the opposition party called the Democrat Party said, no, we don't need elections, that's not good. So I know the foreign minister, I sent him an email, I said, I'm gonna give a talk about Thailand to a bunch of guys next week. Can you just explain to me how it is that a Democrat party can oppose elections? You gotta explain that. And he said, what has been happening in Thailand during the past 10 years is similar to Turkey, Tunisia, Egypt, Russia, Ukraine, Venezuela, etc. Namely, elected governments have become illiberal, abusive, using the argument of majority voice to overcome and ignore the concept of check and balance, rule of law, independent judiciary, and anti-corruption. So this word corruption is obviously important, but what does it mean? What is this slippery concept? It comes in English from the Latin word corrompere, which means to spoil or destroy. And it used to be associated with the idea of a blindfolded judge, you know, like this uh, with the scale balanced. And in ancient times, they said when the judge turns her face, it's because of a payment. That's an example of corruption. And judges were indeed one of the classic locus, uh, locuses of, the, uh, of corruption. It includes bribery. 
which is when I pay you for something that should be not market allocated, but should be done by merit or by right or by zero cost public service. When I have to pay you for it, that's a bribe. But there's also other kinds of things such as influence peddling, nepotism, extortion, theft, and a whole variety of things which have to do with the fact I'm just not doing my job. I'm a teacher. I don't show up for school. Too bad. Did I take a bribe? No, but it's corrupt. Or I'm just sitting there and I say, come back tomorrow. I don't, I'm too busy. And people around the world are outraged by the arrogance and self-serving behavior of many people who are in government. The misuse of office for unofficial ends is a pretty broad definition that encompasses many of those different phenomena. And notice it says office. It doesn't say public office. So a professor can be corrupt. Uh, head of an NGO can be corrupt. A business person can be corrupt. If they're using the office that's supposed to be there to serve the organization, to serve themselves in ways that are illicit. Okay, uh, there's a couple of ideas in economics. This is a series about economics and many people take corruption as a moral problem or a philosophical problem or a political problem or a historical problem or a cultural problem. All those approaches are interesting. Economists say, you know, but if it's a transaction and you're paying for something, maybe there are certain economic conditions that explain when we'd see a lot of bribery and when we wouldn't, and may suggest countermeasures. And so the point is that economic uh, corruption is an economic crime, not a crime of passion. Nobody's sitting there saying, hey, you looked at my sister the wrong way, bang. They're making a careful calculation about whether to offer the bribe or not, or to take the bribe, depending on the risks and the returns. What's the chance I get caught? What's the chance I'm punished if I'm caught? How bad is the punishment? What's the benefit of the service I'm procuring? Is it something that's gonna give me a tremendous benefit? And then there are certain so-called market conditions that characterize when you see a lot of corruption. One of them is this formula. C equals M plus D minus A. When you have monopoly power over a good or service, when you have the discretion to say how much people get, or if they get any at all, and when there's no accountability, then whether you're in Pepperdine or in Panama, you will tend to see a vulnerability of a system to corruption. And this leads to the idea that you go through a system from procurement to license of permits or whatever, and look for the places where somebody has monopoly power plus discretion minus accountability and see if you can fix that. And there's one final economic idea that's important, and that is the idea of a end person prisoner's dilemma, where everybody is stuck in an equilibrium where they're forced to pay the bribe because if they don't, they don't get the service. And so the same schizophrenic attitude holds when at the same time they sincerely say, I wish we didn't have this kind of phenomenon. And as they condemn it, they pay it. Somebody has said that <clears throat> the definition of underdevelopment is when you have this kind of conflict between what you say and what you do when you feel conflicted about, shouldn't do this, on the other hand, that's the way we do things, isn't it a shame? Now, corruption has a lot of harms that it causes. A lot of research in the last 10 or 15 years has shown how corruption twists, when, especially when it gets systemic and gets into deep areas like banking or property rights or major government services like police or justice or healthcare. When you have these things that are gutted by corruption, it distorts incentives so that my job as a Chinese businessman or woman is to spend 25% of my time on cultivating personal relationships with government officials instead of 25% of my time, which should be spent producing more product, better product, cutting costs, opening new markets. That is an estimate, by the way, in the People's Republic of China. It also undercuts institutions, reduces people's confidence in government, leads to lower public services, redistributes money unfairly toward the rich, not toward the poor. Public services become ineffective. And a new result just came out in December, takes a panel data set of quality of government services measured in a bunch of ways, including anti-corruption over a period of time, as well as self-reported happiness of people. And then imagine, you can imagine the difference in difference approach, or you could imagine some panel data analyses where the result is that 
people are more satisfied with their lives in countries having better government quality. Not only that, but also the changes in governance quality since 2005 have led to large changes in the quality of life. This provides a much stronger evidence that government quality can be changed and that these changes have much larger effects than those flowing simply from a more productive economy. For example, the 10 most improved company, countries in terms of delivery quality between 2005 and 2010, when compared to the 10 countries with the most worsened delivery quality, are estimated to have thereby increased the average, on average, uh, evaluations by as much as would be produced by a 40% increase in per capita GDP. Now, if you say, okay, well, there's corruptions, everybody thinks it's a problem, we understand that there is this definitions for it, we see the phenomena, we think it's bad, but then there's this question, what can you do about it? You go home to your roommate tonight or a significant other and say, oh, I heard this interesting presentation about corruption, and you'll hear the seven excuses for not doing anything about corruption. Uh, you know, who can define corruption anyway? It all depends. Some countries, what you think is corrupt is just a Western idea. Anyway, there's been corruption everywhere in the world all the time, always, right? So what can you do about it? All countries have had it, all countries do have it. It was there in ancient times, it's there in modern times, therefore nothing can be done. To which you should say, by the way, illness has been there in every country at every time, it's been there ever since, therefore we don't need hospitals, medicine, public health. And they'd say, no, that's not what I'm saying. You'd say, actually, that is what you're saying, because you're saying if something exists somewhere, therefore you shouldn't do anything about it. Instead of opening your mind and asking, what is it we can do about it? Other excuses come down to at the end, what if the guys on top are corrupt? What if they don't want to do anything? What if we're not in Sweden? Now what do we do? And each of these questions has a complicated but inspiring answer. And today I'm going to give you a few stories about it. First, I'd like to tell you about the Philippines. In 2010, they elected this man, Benigno Aquino III, whose campaign slogan was, when there's no corruption, there'll be no poverty. He gets into office, appoints a terrific cabinet, they get together, they study examples from other countries that made a difference. They look at the data in their country, they use some frameworks from the economics to look at where the most susceptible areas are, and they begin a program with great results. There's a little companion paper to this talk, if you'd like, which you can see the results. <clears throat> oh, let me see, I guess I have them here, I can read, read a few of them to you. Um, in September 2014, four years later, the World Economic Forum called the Philippines the most improved country in the world overall in terms of global competitiveness in the last four years. Um, the Corruption Perception Index rose by 30 points uh, rankings. Doing Business, which is a thing from the International Finance Corporation, had them 95th of 189 countries, uh, which was a movement uh, from the 21st percentile to the 50th percentile. Still not great. Citizen satisfaction with government measured by the social weather stations is higher than it's been for any president in Philippines history, even at this point in Aquino's career. Investment is way up. GDP growth rate is up from 3.6% to 7.2%. And before that typhoon and then second typhoon hit, its growth rate, the cripple of, India, of the Asia, its growth rate was up exceeding that of the People's Republic of China. Still has a long way to go still below average in many f phenomena, but the feeling of progress is palpable in the Philippines. So there are many other examples I could tell you about of success, which means improvement. Colombia in the late 90s, Republic of Georgia 2004 and, and afterwards, of course, classic cases like Singapore and Hong Kong, were, which were once full of corruption. Uh, Qatar, Rwanda, I'm impressed by Indonesia moving from the third percentile to the 40th percentile in six years and so forth, and a number of cities have done it too. I could give you a long list of cities, good case studies exist, of how city administrations were able to turn things from septic to positive and production oriented through controlling corruption. Now one of the themes of this <clears throat> is that the private sector can make a big difference. And I'm gonna give you four quick examples before we have time for questions. First in the Philippines. There's a group in the Philippines called the Institute for Solidarity in Asia headed by the former finance minister and a former, also the former head of the university there named Jess Stanislaw. In the early 2000s, Stanislaw and his colleagues in the private sector 
had mastered the idea of a balanced scorecard, and they went to very energetic mayors in the Philippines who were reform-oriented, the very best mayors, said, we think we can help you by installing these balanced scorecards for you, which means a process you have to develop with your local business community and citizens to develop measures based on objectives you have for better governance and better economy in your local area. Flat, fast forward to 2010, some of these cities did very well, including getting reelected. So other cities started noticing, and by the time Aquino came in, he noticed. And he said, how about if we do this in all our government? And he mainstreamed the idea of balanced scorecards throughout all the different pieces of the Philippines government should be fully implemented by next year, already being linked to budgets and to uh, pay for the top people. I guess I don't have time if we only have 30 minutes to show you a little video of one of these cities, but um, you can take a look at it later on. <clears throat> now, Bangalore, India is another good example. Again, the crucial roles here of the private sector and civil society are ones I want to note in turning around what were very corrupt and inefficient governments. This is a guy named Samuel Paul who, despite his name, is from South India, from a group of Syrian Christians who are apparently came there in 100 AD and have a strong community in the very southern part of India. Former head of the Indian Institute of Management, came to the World Bank, so forth, then went back and decided to set up a social entrepreneurship in his hometown, something called the Public Affairs Center, which focused on a report card on city services, which was a combination of different kinds of information. Um, first, surveys of, you know, you come out of your service, how was your service today? Did you, were you asked for a bribe? Then influential business people, what do you think about the services you're getting, more detailed interviews, and then actually doing things like calling up on the phone, seeing how long it takes to get the phone answered, writing a letter of complaint, seeing how long it takes to get that, triangulating those and coming up with a scorecard for each agency, which was first shared with the agencies so as not to surprise them. Each of the ministers, by the way, said, I'm shocked, but nobody said this study is bogus, I don't believe you. What they didn't like was being compared the Ministry of Transportation with the Ministry of Water, the apples and oranges, and so the chief minister said, okay, well, what are you going to do to improve? In the late 90s, this man came in, <coughs> uh, S.M. Krishna, and he set up something called the Bangalore Agenda Task Force. And this had several functions. It had the NGOs still providing this information from the citizens, working with the press, it had the private sector, including a lot of the high-tech companies in the Silicon Valley nascent there in Bangalore, and the government ministers who would come and vet their own strategies with this council of business, government, and civil society. <clears throat> they used the scorecards as a credible third-party measure of government effectiveness, including fighting corruption. So they weren't relying simply on the agencies to report back on their own objectives and results. They also had civil society's pressure because this stuff was being publicized and they were being involved to push for reforms. They hired experts from outside of the government to help the government work through hard problems. This is something the business sector was good at, finding expertise, training expertise, and indeed developing younger leaders within the government agencies to avoid simply the seniority system that they had. And the result was <clears throat> a remarkable shift in performance. In 2011, the Department of Administrative Reforms and Public Grievances of the Government of India called this a revolution in public services, and it's being copied in more than 30 countries around the world. Notice what, what this did. The report cards had many good ideas. It used outside ideas from outside of India. It wasn't just their Indian homegrown, but it did have an Indian uh, development and flavor to it. It had their own, matched their own needs. It focused on corruption and also on good performance of government. There was political will at the top. The chief minister saw this as an amazing opportunity. and Without his leadership, this partnership would not have happened. Strong actions by business to provide money, yes, but more about expertise and pressure and help. And here's a motto that you might take away with you. A third example I like is from Peru. <clears throat> this woman is Beatriz Bosa a real polymath, a professor of law, director of the Central Bank of Peru, who about 12 years ago started something um, called Ciudadanos al Día, which roughly would be citizens up to date. And it involved first independent surveys 
by an, a private sector polling company of citizens, again, as they left their hospital or public agency or city hall. Say, how was your service today? Did you have to pay a bribe? Short, you know, five minutes at, at most. 15,000 of these are done every three months. Working with the newspapers, they're published on the third page of the newspapers with green, yellow, and red, and the top to the bottom of all the cities in Peru, for example. And you can imagine the furor when this first came out if you're down at the bottom. You can't compare Cusco to Pura. Impossible. You know, we're di Cusco is, has different problems and so forth. But people bought this. And every three months, they get the new ratings. And here, the second thing they did, didn't stop there. Second thing they did was actually quite amazing. They created national prizes in eight categories. They have a prime time television show, like Peruvian Idol, except it's about government reform. <laughs> And they have, first they have people like us that judge all the different cities that have improved or all the different government agencies. And we give our top three to a panel made up of a former great soccer player, a great movie star, a former non-corrupt president if they exist, and so forth, famous author. And they decide among the three, and then they bring the three cities, let's say, also the agency, to come to this thing. And they're all dressed up. They've got their families there. And, and they interview them beforehand. So mayor, uh, are you excited about tonight? Of course, I'm very so excited. You know, Pura has been wonderful. You know, so Cusco, are you excited? Oh, yeah, it's been great. You can watch this on their website. It's hilarious. And then out comes, you know, the great soccer player and says, and the winner for the best city is Pura. And you can imagine Luisa jumping up on her feet, cheering. You know, everybody's going, yes, and it's covered in the press. They've done this something like eight times now on national TV every year. They don't stop there. Next step is to document what works. Now, they don't use the word best practice. They call it buenas practicas, good practice. And they have over 1,200 practices documented <clears throat> for hospitals, cities, and public agencies. Um, and then in, it's online, but it's also in there's a couple of books. There's one that has over, it's like this thick of these good practices. And they don't stop there. <clears throat> if they are asked by a city, let's suppose your city would like some help, they say, yes, we'll come. You have to pay us. We'll come and then develop the surveys for you, especially each office. Then we'll see where your weaknesses are. We'll bring you these buenas practicas. We'll provide training to your office people. And I saw a video about one of these cities they've helped a year later. And the pride on the office manager's face as he described their improvement in the next year's polling from this to this was wonderful to watch. <clears throat> Final example is what happens if the people on top are corrupt? Now what do we do? What's the role of business here? First, an example is integrity pacts, an idea developed by Transparency International. Let's suppose all you guys are road construction firms, right? And you probably know road construction is a very lucrative business in many countries because you've got one-off road contracts. It's hard to say where the market price is. And so if I'm the Minister of Transportation, often I have very nice car very nice house. My kids are going to Pepperdine. My kids are going wherever they want. Right? <laughs> and um, what I will do is negotiate with you about the deals. And you guys may negotiate with each other and create, well, I'll win this one, you win that one. And we end up with me getting about 30%. Me and my staff getting about 30%. <clears throat> so what they did to sort of, by the way, do you want to pay 30% if you could avoid it? Probably not. If you, if you had a long run equilibrium, which was not a 30% bribe, but was a zero bribe, you'd probably say, I'd prefer that. Right? So what you have to do is get together and say, OK, I promise I won't pay a bribe or have any ex post renegotiation of the contract for a bribe. And if anybody else who signs this thinks I do, I will open my books to them. Signed, what's your name? Robert. Robert signed Robert. Okay. And then you all sign it. Comes around here. And then the government agency comes to you and says, um, I really, uh, would you like this contract? I'll tell you what, 25% for you. And you might say, you know, I'd love to. I really would. I, we've had such a good relationship bribing each other in the past. It's been so great uh, being in your pocket and so forth. But I can't because otherwise these guys will inspect. Now, the principle there you can understand. It's a way of trying to get mutual uh, enforcement to replace a corrupt bilateral situation. And it has worked in certain circumstances. I'm also excited about this one which is being done right now in Pakhtun, Khyber Pakhtunkhwa in Pakistan. It's also worked successfully in several other countries in ministries of justice and procurement and so forth. I call it subverting corrupt systems. And the basic idea is this. 
we get together, let's suppose it's road building again, we got our road building guys, and we have four stages of the contract, or five. One is designing who's eligible, called pre-qualification. Designing the terms of the contract for the road and bridge. Awarding the contract. Paying the contract. And then renegotiating the contract for changes in quality, change orders, and so forth. By the way, something like two-thirds of infrastructure projects in Latin America are renegotiated within the first year. Why do you think that is? Because now it's a bilateral monopoly again. Jonathan and I can start talking. You don't have to talk to these guys, you and I. And it's a change order. You know, it's who knows what that costs. Except it's probably 10% more than it really costs, because that's what I'm going to give you for this thing. So at these five stages, you go ask these contractors one-on-one, -on -one, how does the system work? How does that system work? So you might go something like this. How does pre-qualification work? I, don't really wanna, I really don't want to know anything about your behavior or anything about the minister. Just want to know what you've heard about this. Do people ever have to pay bribes for pre-qualification? I don't know. Well, have you ever heard of that? I've heard of it. How much do they have to pay? I don't know. I mean, is it 10% of the contract? No, not that much. Okay. How much, how much would it be? Uh, 3%? Yeah, it could be 3 And does it, all firms have to pay it? No. How many pay it? I don't know. I mean, 1%? No, more than that. <laughs> Pretty soon you get a picture. And you go through each of these stages where the I don't know is developing into a guess. You take 15 such interviews. You give the draft back to you. And promise, by the way, I'll give it back to you to see, to see what you think. By the time, then we have a portrait of the parallel system. Then we invite the government agencies, the donors, the business firms to come to a meeting saying, here's a system that's not working well. What can we do together to make it work better? As I say, this has been working in places. It's in Cairo, which is a tough place in Northwest Frontier. They're trying it on healthcare and education right now as we speak. Yeah, there's a picture of Cairo, Pukhtunkhwa. Oh, Jay, the future of corruption. So you can see I'm an optimist about fighting corruption. I've seen progress work. I've also seen some very, very bad situations. I've had many things that have failed, including South Sudan, which people read about today for the other course that's meeting here. But also others in my book, Tropical Gangsters too. I have five examples of my work leading to nothing. So I'm not a Pollyanna here, but I'm saying there is an existence theorem that some of these things work. But there's someone who's even more optimistic than I, and is John T. Noonan, Jr., the author of the best book about corruption, a book called Bribes. 800 pages long, in vignettes, four or five pages, great bedtime reading, writes beautifully, goes from the Code of Hammurabi up to the Lockheed Affair. It includes an original translation of parts of Dante. So this guy's a real character. And he says, he has a prediction, which goes, I better get this the end here. He compares corruption to slavery. Corruption is like slavery. He say, what? He said, yes, as slavery was once a way of life and now has become obsolete and is incomprehensible to us, so the practice of bribery is the central form of exchange of payment for official action will become obsolete. Not that there aren't occasional cases of slavery today. Trafficking, yes. But systems of slavery we don't have. Not that there won't be occasional cases of bribery and influence peddling, yes, but a systemic situation of exploitation of power for self-interest. Newton says it's going to go away. And he has four reasons why. He says the moral condemnation of bribery will grow for four reasons. First, bribery is shameful in all cultures. He argues it's not true that some cultures accept bribery, it's OK. It is true in that schizophrenic sense that we all go, yeah, we got to do it. That's the way it is here. But nobody says, that's OK, great. I made my fortune, bribery. Nobody says that. Every country has it be illegal. Second, bribery is a sellout to the rich. And no one wants plutocracy, he says. Third, bribery is a betrayal of trust, which is, quote, a precious necessity of every social enterprise. And finally, bribery violates a divine paradigm. Newton argues that our collective resolution and repulsion will grow, leading to the demise of corruption. I would just add this to Professor Newton's ideas, or I should say Judge Noonan. 
that there's going to be more going on. We'll have to help this, meaning people like you. Because it won't be realized without determined effort, including by the private sector. Some of the headings would be practical, feasible strategies to weed out monopoly, increase accountability, clarify discretion, align incentives, in improve enforcement, create coordinated government approaches, enlist the cooperation of business and civil society, improve and empower what publics know and can do, and disrupt corrupt equilibria. And so that's very much a public policy agenda. It's not just a legal agenda of some new laws. It's not just a moral agenda of be good. It's really an agenda of how do we create systems and structures where incentives are aligned with better performance and away from corruption. Let me stop there.